It's almost like saying, I pray for patience. That's not a good idea either. Um, beautiful, though, and I am quite aware and do pray regularly for this church. Uh, Reese and I have been friends for a long time, and so I'm always really um, moved that he would invite me, and it's always good to see you and to see some, uh, some old friends. Um, this morning, I'm, I'm very excited, a um, little bit you know, nervous, because I have an idea I want to share with you that I haven't said really out loud outside of two or three people that are in, in my world of wandering and, and wondering of things. It's a, it's a different way of approaching almost everything in my faith that I've begun to do probably in the last two years. And I just add it. I'm not taking away a lot of other stuff. I'm just adding it. But it's been really helpful for me to get real traction on things that I have always been slippery with. Does that make sense? Like all the things that we want to do. I want to be more faithful. I want to be more generous. I want to be well, all the things. And yet we're, like, we leave church, and an hour and a half later, we're right in the middle of an argument about that exact thing, right? I always say that the, like the, the most difficult time... Um, of the week for families is usually Sunday morning on the way to church, you know, oh my gosh, the fighting, like, and then you finally get it, that's why I always wanted to be a greeter, because I thought greeting was probably the most transformative volunteer place of all, because if you think about it, you're fighting with your family, and the first church greeter goes, good morning, and you're like, hello, and everybody's totally fine, it's like, yeah, it's amazing, look at that guy, he changes the world, um, <clears throat> I'm actually not kidding. That's true, right? I mean, and somehow you weirdly feel better. You're like, oh yeah, okay. Let's let's see if we could do this. But uh, this morning we got some powerful stuff to talk about, so I want to walk you all all through it. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna not push it, uh, but I do think there's some things that need to be pushed a little. Is that fair? A little fair? Okay. So this morning uh, we'll begin, of course, by wishing you a happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, what you might or might not know about St. Patrick are some really powerful things. Like in, as an Irishman, I'll take a little bit of, uh, of attack toward that. So St. Patrick, of course, uh, it's really funny. He chased out all the snakes. Uh, my English friends say that was no big deal. There were only basically two. Uh, but uh, there's all these kinds of things that St. Patrick gets. But one of the things that I didn't know was the true story of St. Patrick. And I'll give you the very short version. Some of you may already know this, but... St. Patrick was actually um, a British um, person that was uh, taken uh, by Irish pirates to Ireland when he was a kid, when he was young, uh, and was enslaved in Ireland brutally by the Irish who had all kinds of different religious ways of doing things at the time, um, and they were, they were a difficult folks. Um, and for six years, he endured that. And he escaped. He literally got away, got all the way back home to Britain. And while he was there, guess who he encountered? Jesus. He met the Lord. It became deeply faithful. And he began to try to explore exactly what he was going to do with this new profound reality in his life. And guess what he was asked to do? Go back to Ireland. And so St. Patrick becomes St. Patrick because Patrick, right, was asked to go do the most difficult thing you could possibly imagine. Hey, remember those people that enslaved you? Remember those people that fired you? Remember those people that divorced you? Remember those people that beat you? Remember those people that lied to you? Yeah, I want you to go back. And I want you to introduce love to them in a loving way. Now, I have, to gotta, I have to really say, like, you better be called by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to pull this off, okay? So if, if you're not, like it says in Acts, you wait on the Holy Spirit, okay? You don't just go kicking down doors to do this kind of stuff. But Patrick was. He was actually called to do it. And he goes there, and what does he do? Not only does he transform Ireland, but then the belief of Ireland historically, literally many people believe, saves the world like salt and light in a world which needed it really badly. One tiny little nation's deep faithfulness turns out to be the most extraordinary marker of their historic time, and St. Patrick is that guy. But I want you to imagine just in part what did he have to sacrifice to go back to Ireland? What did he have to say yes to? And what did he have to say no to? 
to make that kind of decision. You know, we wear green or we have green eyes and we talk about this stuff, but really this morning, when you see green, when you wear green, when you hear St. Patrick today, I want you to think, this is deep, profound, faithful sacrifice on behalf of one man to save one nation, one people, one person at a time, and maybe, go check out the history, how the Irish saved the world is an interesting thing, especially because, you know, written by Irishmen for Irishmen, but anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I want you to imagine what that might look like, because that's the story. And so when we think about sacrifice, which is what we're really talking about this morning, here's the little thing. When I tell you about sacrifice and I tell you the story of St. Patrick, you're like, yes, the amazing martyrs of our faith. Ah, like all this kind of stuff. Like, yes, I mean, this way of picturing who we're supposed to be. Yes, the sacrificing for Jesus. Absolutely. Like we have all these other kinds of things. But don't you also get the feeling like you're like this little hedge in you that's like, ah, this feels like a big weight of guilt and shame. I, I, I'm not that person. I haven't done that stuff. I'm not sure how to pull that stuff off. How do I actually get there? And what I want to tell you is that the big sacrifice that you might imagine that you need to do, this big sacrificial life of living this way, maybe, and here's the stuff that I'm trying out on you, maybe you're already doing it. Maybe it's already in your life. Maybe there's just something much more simple and much more profound about what it might mean to live a sacrificial life. The scripture uh, this morning I'm going to read comes from a psalm. You've been going through psalms. Uh, and this one is Psalm 51. I'm going to read 1 through 12. Um, but if you would, if you would stand where you are, we're going to do a little thing that's a part of kind of who I am. Uh, it's super strange, so I know that. Uh, but it's also something Jesus did every morning and every evening, so it's an important thing, I think, for us to set in ourselves. It's called the Shema. Uh, it comes to Deuteronomy 6. Uh, now, I'm going to say it with, with a little bit of thunder, but not a lot, because we had a lot last night, and I know we're in a small room. But I want to encourage you that this is something that Jesus did as a way of setting his faith. I'm going to do a little in Hebrew. Anybody in here speak Hebrew? Excellent. That means you won't know how bad mine is. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, but we're going to do it. And this is what it sounds like. I'm going to say it. Just say it right after me. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. <laughs> Good try. Uh, Adonai Echad. Good, good. The spitting part was good, but it got on him a little. Uh, so you all right? Yeah. Little towels for Hebrew. You always have to have them. Um, then we'll say it in English. Ready? Hear, O Israel. Hear, o Israel. The, Lord is the Lord is our God. The Lord alone. The Lord. Love the Lord your God. Love. With all your heart. Love. With all your soul. Love. With all your might. Love. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Amen? Amen? All right. Ready? A little bit of thunder, and then I'm going to read the scripture, and then we're going to go. I like, everybody's like, thunder, what does that mean? I was like, it's fine. Uh, might turn me down just a tiny bit. Uh, <clears throat> but here's, here's how this goes. Ready? Repeat after me. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai, Adonai Echad. Adonai Echad. Hear, o Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your, heart. With all your soul, with all your, with all your might, with all your heart. and love the Lord and your neighbor as yourself. And love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Here's Psalm 51. With that on our hearts, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Here's a powerful piece just for you to know. This is David writing a psalm after he has just faced through Nathan that he has committed adultery, that he has engaged with uh, Bathsheba, so in my opinion, brutally, and also sent uh, Uriah to die in the battlefield. So as a king, maybe the lowest point, maybe, but it's pretty close. I'll read it one more time. Have mercy on me, O God. 
according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken and crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. These are the words of the Lord. You can be seated. It's powerful to think about some of the things that we're talking about right now during Lent. In fact, as we're talking about Lent, just real quick, how many of you gave something up or took something on for Lent? Anybody doing that? Yeah? Okay. Uh, the rest of you sinners uh, might think, no. Uh, it's, it's kind of a tradition that kind of gets picked up here and there. Not everybody does it. Some people do. Uh, our family always did it, so it just kind of carried over for me. But I am curious, if you don't mind, what are you? What did you pick up or give up for Lent? Do you mind telling me? Oh. <laughs> okay, cool. So you just like. Oh, that's cool. So you added sort of a, a woven prayer throughout your day. It's really good. Uh, most of ours are like we give up caffeine. Uh, my uh, middle son gave up soda. He's always so brave. He's like, I'm giving up Cokes. And we're like, great. But he takes it really seriously. So we were on a little vacation this weekend, and it's just like wall of fountain drinks. And he's standing there, and he's like getting the water. And I'm like, you're such a good guy. I would give myself breaks, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, he takes it seriously. Or uh, like I said, caffeine. You know, people just do all kinds of stuff. My favorites are when people start taking things on, like this one. What do, or, or giving things up by taking things on. Here's, here's one. What if you gave up guilt as a motivator? That'd be interesting. In fact, when I did it, I tried this on. because Somebody said that to one time, and I was like, oh, here's the kicker. Uh, you have to mention to your family that you're giving up guilt because it turns out there's a lot of guilt that we use with each other. And so if you have, you're standing in front of people that you love, and they're like, da-da-da-da-da, and you're like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. You've used guilt. Now you're fighting. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole different kind of thing. Here's another one. What if you gave up shame? Right? It would be interesting to see what would happen. Because really, biblically, we might be guilty of things. We might even should be, in a healthy way, ashamed of something. I get that. But what if that wasn't our identity, but so often we hold it in? What if we gave that up? Who would we be without guilt and shame? Those are interesting to give up for Lent, right? But we do this kind of stuff all the time. We give things up. We wonder what they'll be. Um, and, and I think that there's kind of a, a powerful piece of that because what I think we're really trying to do is get to a place of, I don't know, there's big weird words like holiness, but it might be wholeness, wholeheartedness. There's a great word called flourishing, which I do a lot of work with right now. Uh, just really a powerful thing. Where it's almost like we're trying to figure out who we really are and how we can become the fullest version of that. I mean, and if you don't think that that's what you're doing, imagine how you feel about your kids. Don't you want that for them? Don't you want desperately for your kids to kind of discover fully who they are and live their freest and fullest version? Like whatever. Wouldn't that be the best? Wouldn't that be the most amazing life? Yeah. And it, be, it just kind of rumbles in you really quick, just like that. It happens. These are the, the pictures, and, and you go back and you try to figure out, well, how do you do that? How do you, how do you live that life? And one of the major things that kind of come with all that is, um, uh, is this idea of sacrifice. Why? Well, sacrifice often is connected to things just like it is here with David, where we've broken something. We've made a mess. 
We've destroyed something. We haven't done something, whatever it is. And sacrifice gets us back somehow. That's what David is asking for. He's like, I've ruined everything and become something I never would have imagined. I am this person now. And everyone in this whole kingdom knows it. And even worse, even though they all know it, it's so much worse between me and you. Because God, you have given me all of this. You have made all of this possible. I know it more intimately than anybody else, and I've ruined it. Ruined it. Right? And that's where David is. He's like, how do I get back? Well, here's what David knows. David knows that in the story of God, one of the ways that people get back really consistently is sacrifice. Think about it. Adam and Eve. This is an ancient story. How does Adam and Eve get back sacrifice? Well, how come they don't die? If you eat from this tree, you will die. How come they don't die? Well, that's a weird question. I have never thought about that. Or I know the answer, and I'm not going to say it out loud because you're asking a rhetorical question either way. Here's the thing. Adam and Eve don't die because there has to be sacrifice. What sacrifice was made? God made sacrifice on behalf of Adam and Eve. You know how I know that? Because all of a sudden, they're wearing skins. God provides them with animal skins. Do you think God just provided, maybe God could have just made animal skins. You know, I'm like, not going to make the whole animal, just going to make the skins to give you guys for this mess up, right? Or something really powerful happens kind of off stage, off the story that is assumed, and that is that God kills for the first time. There's death for the first time. There has to be death. There is death. And that's how Adam and Eve have clothing and can go forward at all. It's powerful. And then you have uh, Abram, right? You have all of the promises of God that are cut from sacrifice. All of the priest work. There's a ton of the Bible that's dedicated to this craziness of all the smoke and fire in the temple, right? That's all sacrifice on behalf of people and or whole communities just to try to make things right. There's this moment where there is so much animal sacrifice. Imagine it this way. Imagine it this way, because it's all that animal sacrifice is built on the sin of a whole nation. Now, let's get one temple and put all of the sins of our nation into the burning sacrifice. How much burning do you imagine there is going to be at that temple just for you and me? Right? Just for us here. That's a lot. But this is the thing, and it's really weird. It's like a strange thing for us, but it makes total sense in the culture and time. And so David lays himself out on that. He's like, you are the God of restoration. You have made a way to restore even the darkest, even the most difficult. And that's what's on David's heart. He knows God well enough to know that if he gets open and vulnerable and true, that God will do all the work. And that, of course, is what we're celebrating with Jesus because what's on Jesus' mind when it says, and he turned his face toward Jerusalem, is so many different things. I know that you all have been processing through. What's on Jesus' mind in these? How does he work this out? So what's on Jesus' mind as he turns his face toward Jerusalem and begins to walk toward the cross? What would be on your mind? All kinds of terrible, terrifying things. Maybe. Here's why. What's kind of wild when you read it, and I think it's interesting, is the idea that What's on Jesus' mind, we can kind of know, and we can kind of not know. In fact, it scares me to death to go, this is what's on Jesus' mind. The truth is, here's what's weird. Anybody that gets to stand in front of you and talk about God in an authoritative way that you would take on into your lives, that's crazy town. That I'm actually standing up here and think somehow that I should be able to do that, I promise that's nuts. It's just wild. And you have to, The only way that somebody ends up in this spot is because somehow they had to. And I promise I have to. We can talk about that later. Uh, but, but it's true. Here's this picture. Jesus' mind opens up. How do we know? We know through the Gospels. Well, what do we know through the Gospels? Well, it gets a little bit 
I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of not quite as clear as you might think. You ever notice that the Gospels kind of tell slightly different stories from slightly different perspectives? That's not scary. Sometimes I think we want everything to line up and our insecurities start to flow out on the Bible, thinking that the Bible is an answer book, when the truth is the Bible is a question book. And if you don't think it's a question book, you're asking yourself right now, what does he mean by that? Nailed it. <clears throat> but when you see what Jesus says about his own death, it's a little different in different Gospels. In one Gospel, he seems to be sort of learning as he goes, like in the Gospel of Matthew. It says he knew, or he came to understand at different places. That's not necessarily the Jesus that I grew up with. The Jesus that I grew up with was the Jesus of John. In the Gospel of John, Jesus has absolute command the entire time. Zero question about it, and he foretells what's going to go down all along the way. Not so in Matthew. It's interesting to me to think about that John, probably about eight or ten years old at the time, Matthew was an adult. Does that change the way your perspective remembers the story? Does it keep the Holy Spirit from teaching us what actually happened? No. Is it helpful? Absolutely. So as we walk through, here's what I want to suggest. The question is, well, does Jesus know what's going on and he's just walking through in this amazing moment of faith with a banner and a sword? Or is he not sure? I think it's both. How could that be? Well, because I think that what the Bible tells us is good and true, and at the same time, there's always a paradox. Always. But if you're not ready for the paradox of our faith, then remember, that's the whole cross. It's a paradox being where two things that seemingly uh, are total opposites live quite beautifully in the same place, like life, and death, like sacrifice and life. They, they all live in the same place. We try to separate them all the time. But what I'm telling you is any real depth of your faith is going to constantly hold two very difficult things in the same place. And God says, and that's good. So here's this picture. Jesus is walking, and his mind must be both overwhelmed and clear. How do you do that? How do you live a life of being both overwhelmed and clear. Well, I think we can all say that we lived overwhelmed. You live overwhelmed? I have four kids. I am overwhelmed all the time. My, my son, my oldest, got married uh, last um, summer, and uh, that was overwhelming. I had almost no way of handling what was happening at all times, but I'm really good at smiling and being nice. So everybody, I think, thought, look how well he's doing, and I'm like, I'm freaking out. They got real weird over Christmas when it was our turn, which is a thing now. We have turns uh, with our kids, which I'm grateful for. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but what wh our turn was is we had Ryan and his wife, Emily Renee, were at our home. And so what was weird is our, we have a little tradition where the kids come out and they do the thing and, and we pretend like we're asleep. And, oh, did Santa come? Like, we have this whole ridiculous thing, right? They've wanted us to maintain that through their adulthood, which I'm like, that's a problem. We need to all see, like, <laughs> it's weird. Y'all are weird kids. Um, this is your mom. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what was the, right? I mean, every time. See, yeah, you know. Um, and so so they, they come in there, and this time it was Emily Renee, and she's standing in our bedroom door like, this is weird. And I'm like, see, it's weird. I told you. A new person says it's weird. It's weird. You know, but it's, it's like this, this constant sort of thing where you're, you realize that you lose something? Like we lost Ryan in some ways. He belongs to a whole other world and ours at the same time. And we gained Emily Renee somehow. How did that happen? How do I build that in my life? Oh, well, God has to show us that it's both clear as a bell, this really happened, and it's really confusing at the same time. How can we live in that way? Here's the thing. Overwhelmed is going to be uh, just something that kind of comes up and whispers in your ear all the time, right? Anybody in here overwhelmed about something? Yeah, it's really fun when I do that. Uh, some people like, are like, yes, right now. Like, I was waiting for you to say that. My hand was here, and boom, now it's here, you know. Yeah, yeah, because it feels that way. Yeah, okay, so that often is a, a normal human thing. We have overwhelmed all the time because things are changing. Right? 
The only time that things aren't changing is when we're dead. So maybe sometimes we're like, okay, overwhelmed. You know, they can do that. Here's the thing. How do you live the clarity in the middle of being overwhelmed? Because that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus walks with his face to the cross with everything flying around him from the entire power of the Roman world to every promise and sacrifice that had been built in the Bible from all of Adam and Eve through Moses and Noah and Deborah, everybody all the way through were piling into this one guy all at the same time. Think that was probably overwhelming? I do. Does he have a sense of that? Yeah, his mom's been telling him that for a long time. His dad raised him in some way, though mysteriously, to be this person. Like, this has been walking out. We've been seeing him say things that blow the minds of everybody through the last three years. The entire world is both upside down and right side up at the same time. When you're around him, nothing makes sense except everything makes sense. And now he's walking to what we don't know is going to be the end. They don't know. They think ultimately that he's going to finally rise up and beat the Romans. Kick them out, just like the Maccabees did a little while back. But of course, we know that's not the thing. And he, so does he. He knows he's not war. He knows he's peace. How does he do it? How do we do it? I'll give you three things to help me. Here's the first. When overwhelmed is whispering in my ear, and overwhelmed tends to whisper in my ear at four in the morning. Anybody wake up in the middle of the night? Yeah. I wake up like at four in the morning. I haven't done it in a while, but for almost a year I was woken up at four in the morning with just the worst things in my ears. Terrible. So here's what I did to write the ship, to become both clearly in the thing, but also clear. First is this. A daily ritual. Have a daily ritual. You need to have a way of anchoring yourself in the storm. It does not have to be big. In fact, it's really good if it's small because then you won't necessarily miss. If you're a morning person, get up. First thing, read a devotion that you like. Sometimes you'll read the devotion and you're like, this is so fascinating. I'm going to go read all the scriptures about it and find the three authors that he, like, you'll, you'll, you'll go crazy. And sometimes you're like, barely through it, slam it closed, and you're off. That's fine. Doesn't matter. Okay, don't miss. Best you can. And if you do miss, it's fine. Just go back the next day. But find a way to get a track, because this is what you're doing. You're building muscle of sacrifice. You're building strength. Here's the second piece. Once you get that ritual going, the second piece is find a way to be both vulnerable and present at the same time. Jesus does this beautifully. He's wide open. Like he says stuff in John like, I'm going to die. We all know that. There's no good ending here. And at the same time, what does he say when he's at the Gethsemane? God, please take this away. This is not what I want. This is the worst. Clarity and honesty, vulnerability. I know clearly what's going to happen, and yet I am fully human. I can be afraid of that. It's okay. Sometimes we blame ourselves. We, we kind of pile in on ourselves because we have feelings. You know, and guess what? You can't control your feelings. They come to you. It's just what they are. Issues. How do you respond to them? How do we move from there? So vulnerability and then presence. Here's the thing that gets me every time. <laughs> I don't know if you do this, but when I wake up at 4 in the morning and I'm overwhelmed, um, what I really want to do is sacrifice all of the other people that I blame, right? That's what I really want to do. I'm like, if we could line up the sacrifice, it would be super cool if all this would happen. And I think about like things like revenge. Anybody get into revenge, into the dark parts? Okay, it's just me. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, but revenge really is just you thinking you know better than God what that person needs. That's all that really is. And so you have all these plans that are going on, and they just start to kind of get all inside your mind uh, and everything that kind of comes with it. So 
the, the reality is to try to figure out how do, you, how do you stop all that and you sacrifice your need to control and you begin to say to God, here's what I am terrified of. I was on a mountain in uh, Colorado nine months ago. It was one of the hardest times of my life. Just really painful. And um, I sat down to journal with God and he said, uh, I want you to write down all your fears. I was like, this doesn't feel like fun. I would rather have another cup of coffee or like a sweet roll or something. That'd be cool. He said, go ahead. So I write them down. And he's like, good. And I'm like, Phew, got that done. That was terrible. He says, okay, now I want you to go back. And this time, I want you to go all the way to the ground. I remember that phrase. What he meant was, write what it would mean. If this happened, then this would happen. If this happened, then this would happen. This happened, this happened. And it would mean this about you. And I wrote all of it down. Because I figured out that most of my fears are only these halfway thought things. But in this case, I wrote every little detail. It was terrible. It was really terrible. And then I closed the book, and I was like, okay, is this a punishment? What's happening right here? He's like, okay, let's do it again. I'm like, what? So we go back, and he says, this time I'm going to give you little notes. And you can see in my journal, there's little notes. This one is meaningless. This one is got some, real, some reality to it, but you've twisted it up. This has, and all these other kinds of things. It's wild. And this whole time over three days. And then fully, here's one of the crystal clear things I had. There are things that are truly in this life to be afraid of, my fears. There are real things to be afraid of in this world. But most of what I'm afraid of are things that I put on other people or myself that are only half-baked. And in doing so, I imprison them and me. Is that true? See, because it was a sacrifice, I realize now, to write it all down and to be vulnerable, to let my fears pour out on a page. It was a sacrifice to actually allow for the thoughts to get all the way to the bottom, to the ground. But then the God of grace and love picked me up and began to show me how in all that overwhelmed, he could walk clearly in that time. I got to do just that. The last thing that you can do. So um, find a ritual, present and vulnerable. Uh, and the third is if you don't know what to do, which happens a lot, even when you know what to do. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm the dad. I know how to do stuff. And then you're like in a situation, you're like, except we haven't ever seen this before, right? And I don't know what to do, but I'm supposed to know what to do. Or whatever it is, we have all these things that we kind of know, but we don't. Well, here's what I've stopped doing. I've stopped guessing with my best hope in mind. I've stopped asserting myself when I should know. <laughs> like a seventh grader, you know? Although there could be some beautiful seventh graders, so don't get me wrong. I wasn't a great seventh grader. Here's what I do now. I stop and I back up and I say, God, include me. I want to join you in your story. I don't want to write my own. Because here's the thing. Basically, sacrifice, biblical sacrifice, means that you're turning your story over from you to the one that made you. You're turning your story over from your vision and ability to the one with infinite vision and ability. You're turning your story over from all the collection of misunderstandings and brokennesses and woundednesses of your life, and you're turning it over to a place that says, I can restore you entirely and show you who you really are. And here's the final piece. It can feel like a lot. It can feel like, oh, living this life of sacrifice. Oh, gosh, look at the same. Oh. You're already living this life. But it's not as easy as you think it is. You already sacrifice. 
you already prioritize your time according to what? You already sacrifice and prioritize your money according to what? You sacrifice your parenting, your being a son to your folks, your family, according to what? What's, what's your goal? What's your point? What are you trying to do? Are you just trying to survive? You're trying to live? You're trying to work it out? That's usually what people do. You have something built into you over a lifetime that says that you should be or shouldn't be this one person, but that not, might not be true at all. If you show me the intent, I can tell you the outcome. If you show me a place where there is no intent, there is no real outcome. Not anything satisfying. Here's the simplicity of what Jesus offers us in this story of sacrifice. Please don't think of yourself as the great hero of sacrifice that's giving your life up for Jesus. That's beautiful. But that's not really all that interesting or doable. Think of it this way. You're a human being that is making sacrifices, Jesus is going to offer you the best intent you could ever have. That you would become the fullest and freest version of yourself. See, because the Father looks at you with ten times the love you look at your own children. And it's eager for you to be celebrated in your own heart. Your sacrifices, you're making them already. You are. You'll make them today. Where are you going to go eat? Where are you not going to go eat? You made a choice to come here. All these things. You're sacrificing one thing for another. All the time. You're already sacrificing. The question is, what would it be like if you began to sacrifice increasingly toward love and hope and joy? What if you just took one thing and made it about Jesus? Well, then you'd be a disciple. It would be an extraordinary thing. Turns out you already have this muscle. The invitation for those of you that are burdened and overwhelmed, as Jesus says, is come to me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me take all of your scattered, overwhelmed, insecure broken, wounded motivations and make them one. Love. And here's the kicker. If you give them to me, I'll do them through you. Turns out, really, sacrifice isn't something that we do it's something that we become. Living sacrifice. And here's my favorite thing. <laughs> Frederick Buechner says this. A sacrifice is making something sacred by giving it away for love. A sacrifice is making something sacred by giving it away for love. When you make your children sacred, give them away for love. You want to make your work sacred, give it away for love. Give your day away, every piece. And it will transform your life. In Jesus' name, amen.